Derek Prince shares how the Holy Spirit, inbreathed by the resurrected Christ, outpoured by the ascended Christ, manifests himself through nine supernatural gifts. Now, Exercising Spiritual Gifts, Part 1, Receive the Holy Spirit. The theme for my talk today is indicated once again by the title, Receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is a very central theme to the whole of the New Testament and it's a theme which vitally concerns every Christian because every Christian is expected to receive the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately within the church, particularly shall we say the evangelical Pentecostal charismatic section of the church, there is a great deal of confusion and misunderstanding about what it means to receive the Holy Spirit. For instance, your good Baptist will say, well, I received the Holy Spirit when I was born again. There's nothing more to receive. And the Pentecostal will say, no, you didn't receive the Holy Spirit when you were born again. You don't receive the Holy Spirit till you're baptized in the Spirit and speak in tongues. And they tend to get rather angry with one another. Now, as in most cases where sincere Christians disagree on the basis of Scripture, the truth is that each of them is partly right and partly wrong. And I believe I can help you today to unravel this confusion. The fact of the matter is that the New Testament speaks of two different ways in which people receive the Holy Spirit. And when we distinguish these two ways, then there's no more confusion. And I'm going to uh, use two historical situations from the New Testament to define the two ways, to describe them, and to distinguish between them. And I'm going to refer to two Sundays, two Sundays of tremendous historical importance for the Christian church. The first I call Resurrection Sunday. The second, which came seven weeks later, I call Pentecost Sunday. Now on both those Sundays, the believers had an experience of receiving the Holy Spirit. But it was different. And when we can see the nature of each experience, then we can understand where we are in relation to this personally. Have I received the Holy Spirit? Is there something more for me to receive? What is involved in receiving the Holy Spirit? I'd like to read, therefore, first of all, the account of the Resurrection Sunday, first appearance of Jesus to his disciples in a group, as it's recorded in John chapter 20. Reading from verse 9, John chapter 20, from verse... 19 through verse 22. All right, John 20, 19 through 22. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. You know, of course, that the first day of the week is what we call Sunday. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. Sunday is the beginning of a new week. In Hebrew, it's called Yom Rishon, the first day. So... Hebrew is actually much more faithful to the Bible and its titles for the days of the week than we are. Regrettably, our days of the week in English and in most European languages are named after pagan deities. Like Wednesday is Woden's Day, Thursday is Thor's Day, Sunday is the day of the sun, you understand? It's a regrettable fact that we are very pagan in the way we define the days of the week, whereas for Hebrew it's day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, then day seven is Shabbat, the Sabbath, and then Sunday is Yom Rishon. If you live, in, for instance, as we do in Jerusalem, the busiest day of the week is Sunday. Everything takes off. They've been resting on the Sabbath, and then everybody gets going the first day of the week. And most or many congregations of believers in Israel hold their worship services on Saturday because Sunday is a day of work. Understand? That's just by the way, but as I say, there's no extra charge for that. So going back to verse 19, being the first day of the week, 
when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why did he do that? to convince them that they were looking at the same body that they had seen pierced on the cross. Gloriously transformed, but still the same body. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I've always felt that was an understatement. <laughs> then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now I want to comment on that last verse that I read. Um, the word that's translated breathed in secular language is used of a flute player blowing into the mouth of his instrument to produce music. The suggestion to me is not that Jesus stood at a distance and breathed at them collectively, but that he breathed into each of them, and as he did so, said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now the Greek language is very sensitive about tenses. There's more than one tense of the imperative. And this particular tense indicates that they were to receive when he said the words. So at that time, each of those disciples received the Holy Spirit. There's no question about that. What was the implication of that? My understanding is that at that point they passed from Old Testament salvation to New Testament salvation. You understand that there were people who were saved in the Old Testament. They were saved through faith in a sacrifice that had not yet been offered but was promised through prophecies and types. So their faith looked forward to something incomplete. But in the New Testament, we are saved through faith in a sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, which is historically accomplished. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. We look back to a finished work. Now, in order to experience New Testament salvation, Paul says there are two things that are needed in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So for New Testament salvation, there are two requirements. You confess Jesus as Lord, and you believe that God has raised him from the dead. Well, those disciples had already confessed Jesus as Lord, but this was the first moment that they believed that God had raised him from the dead. They passed out of the Old Testament dispensation into the New Dis Testament dispensation, and it's a pattern. And it happened to them through encountering the resurrected Christ face to face, and through receiving from him the inbreathed spirit. Now the word in Greek for spirit, pneuma, is also the word for wind and for breath. So when he breathed into them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, he was saying, receive holy breath. It was a direct person-to-person -person transaction between them. They became part of the new creation. If your mind goes back to the first creation, when God formed a body of clay there in the garden, in order to bring, make him a living soul, what did he do? He breathed into him the breath of life, and he became created. He became a living soul. The new creation follows the same pattern. But it's not the, the Lord in the garden. It's the resurrected Savior who has passed through death and come out of the tomb and who breathes into his, into his disciples a a life that is totally victorious. It's a life that has conquered sin and Satan and death and the grave. That's the in-breathed breath of the resurrected Savior. And I personally believe that it's a pattern for everybody who's to enter into new salvation. I don't believe you can be saved without meeting Jesus. I don't mean that you mean that you meet him 
visibly as the disciples did, but I don't believe there's any way into the true church of Jesus Christ except Jesus. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So, I believe this is a pattern for the new birth, for every person. We have to meet Jesus, not just believe a doctrine or join a church, but have a personal encounter with the resurrected Christ and receive from him the inbreathed breath of God, which is the Holy Spirit, and become a new creation. We pass from death to life. I remember when I met Jesus face to face, not visibly, but face to face, in an army barrack room in the British Army in World War II. I didn't have any doctrinal knowledge of salvation. I couldn't say I was born again. I didn't know what you had to do to be saved, but believe me, I was saved. Later on, I got the doctrine. But I've met Jesus, and I just want to tell you, dear friends, that you cannot meet Jesus and stay the same. You can join a church and remain unchanged. You can believe all sorts of things with your head and remain unchanged. But when you meet the resurrected Christ, it's transforming. And it's permanent. That's 45 years ago. That stood the test of time. There was nothing in it of doctrine for me. Really, there wasn't for the disciples. They didn't have a sudden scriptural revelation. They met Jesus. And they received the Holy Spirit. Divine, eternal, resurrection life. Incorruptible life. Life that's undefeatable. John says later about that, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. You can't be defeated with that life in you. It's undefeatable. It's conquered all evil. It's supreme. That's wonderful. <clears throat> now, I, I, I read from my outline at this point. At this point, the disciples received divine, eternal resurrection life. But they still lacked direction for ministry. It wasn't many days later that Peter went out fishing again. He still didn't know what God's destiny for him was. And they made no impact on the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem just went on the same. They were in the temple praising and blessing God every day, but it didn't change anything in Jerusalem. And Jesus told them after this experience, in the period between this Resurrection Sunday and the time of his ascension, Jesus told them, there is more to receive. Don't believe that you've got it all. <laughs> when I meet people who tell me I've got it all, when I was saved, I say, if you've got it all, let's see it. Where is it? <laughs> it should show. <laughs> I want to read two passages in which Jesus made it very clear that there was more to receive than they had received through new birth. Wonderful though that was. Luke 24, <clears throat> verses 48 and 49. And bear in mind, these words were spoken shortly before his ascension. Something like 40 days after his resurrection. <clears throat> and you are witnesses of these things. He's talking to the disciples. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So he said, there's more to come. The Father's promise you haven't yet received. But when you receive it, you'll receive power to be my witnesses. And then again in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. And then he explains what the promise of the Father is. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's the promise of the Father. Somebody has estimated there are 7,000 promises of God in the Bible, but this is the promise, the promise of the Father for his children. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he explained the purpose in verse 8. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. 
and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So that's the promise to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and the purpose to receive power to be witnesses. That had not yet happened. This was approximately 40 days after the Resurrection Sunday experience where they had received the Holy Spirit in new birth. But Jesus said, there's another experience coming in which you will be endued with power to be my witnesses. And almost all commentators in the Bible from every background agree that that second promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. So we turn now to Acts chapter 2 and we read uh, some verses that describe the fulfillment of the promise. First of all, we'll read the first four verses of Acts 2. Now, they were talking now about Pentecost Sunday. Now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance or gave them to speak. Now this is the fulfillment of the promise. And I want to point out to you three successive phases of this experience. First of all, the Holy Spirit descended like a mighty wind and filled all the house there where they were sitting. Bear in mind that Linguistically, the word baptize means to dip or to immerse. This is an unquestionable linguistic fact. So every baptism has to be an immersion. Baptism in water is an immersion in water. But baptism in the Holy Spirit is an immersion in the Holy Spirit. You see, baptism in water, you go down into the water and come up out of it. But baptism in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit comes down upon you and immerses you from above. You can compare going down into a swimming pool, being baptized, or walking under Niagara Falls. Each of them is an immersion. But the second one is an immersion from above. I remember the first time I watched Niagara Falls, I said to myself, you couldn't be half a second under that without being immersed. But it's not an immersion by which you go down into, it's an immersion by which it comes down over you. And so every one of the disciples in that upper room at that point was immersed in the Holy Spirit descending upon them from above. It says it filled all the place where they were sitting. So they were totally immersed in the Holy Spirit. Phase one. Phase two, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Each one received the Holy Spirit within to the point of being filled. And phase three is what I call the overflow. They began to speak with new languages as the Spirit gave them to speak. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says this, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, when your heart is filled to overflowing, the overflow will take place through your mouth in speech. So this is scriptural. When they were filled and could contain no more, the overflow took place. They began to speak as the Spirit gave them to speak. Those are the three phases of that experience. Immersion from above, infilling, and outflow. Now, theoretically, you can stop at any point. They could have been immersed but not filled. Or they could have been immersed and filled but not have any overflow. But my question is, why settle for less than the best? I often preach to Catholics, and when I do so, I always remind them that their two favorite figures in the New Testament, Mary and Peter, both received it that way. And I say to them, if that's how they received it, why should you receive it any other way? And when I put it that way, I've seen hundreds of Catholics receive the Holy Spirit in the next few minutes. All right. Now, let me read my commentary on this second experience. The disciples now received manifest supernatural power. Let's 
emphasize those words, it was manifest. Everybody knew it had happened. It wasn't just an inward experience. It was supernatural. And it was power. They received boldness to witness, which they hadn't had before. They'd been born again, but they had no boldness in their witness. They received insight into Scripture. In the, ne in the next few minutes, G Peter, without any concordance, without any notes, stood up and said, This is that which the prophet Joel prophesied. He couldn't have said that an hour earlier. He wouldn't have had any insight. Instantly, the Scriptures became alive to them in a new way. And thirdly, they were released to their apostolic mission. Peter never talked about going fishing after Pentecost. And finally, all Jerusalem felt the impact. Within a few hours, everybody in Jerusalem knew that something unusual had taken place. Now, when they were born again, it didn't get around. But when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, it got around. How many of you know from experience, it doesn't stay hidden for long? <laughs> And somehow it stirs things up. Have you ever noticed that? Somebody asked my friend Bob Mumford, what's the evidence of the baptism? He replied, trouble. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's look at this little summation at the bottom here. Uh, I just want to put the two Sundays side by side. On the left-hand side, Resurrection Sunday. On the right-hand side, Pentecost Sunday. And you notice there are three differences. That exclamation mark down there in my original outline was up here, but I never, never mind about that. That's okay. Um, Resurrection Sunday, the resurrected Christ. Pentecost Sunday, the ascended, glorified Christ. Resurrection Sunday, the in, uh, it should be in-breathed spirit, not in-breathed Christ. Just correct that if you've been writing it. In-breathed spirit. Pentecost Sunday, the outpoured spirit. Resurrection Sunday, the result, life. Pentecost Sunday, the result, power. Now, neither contradicts the other. It isn't a question of either or. Both are God's purpose for all of his people. But the fact that you've had the Resurrection Sunday experience doesn't mean that you don't need the Pentecost Sunday experience. Does that clear to you? See? So the Baptist who says, I got it when I was saved, he's right. But he didn't get it all. In fact, <laughs> I don't think most of us have got it all, to tell you the truth. I think there's a lot more for most of us to get. But I hope that makes it clear. To me, when I saw that and put those two Sundays side by side, I no longer had any problems. Who has received the Holy Spirit? Who hasn't received the Holy Spirit? Every born-again child of God through rebirth has received the Holy Spirit as life. But every born-again child of God, according to the New Testament, needs to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and receive the supernatural power for witness. They don't conflict. They fit together perfectly. Fanu, would you be kind enough to turn the sheet over and let's see what we've got there. Now, the next... Ah, uh, now we've got the exclamation, exclamation mark, you see, in the right place. All right, receive the Holy Spirit. I want to point out to you that that was not a, re a, a recommendation. <laughs> it was a command. Jesus doesn't usually make recommendations. He gives orders. All right, now here's something very crucial. From Acts chapter 2 onwards, in the New Testament, the phrase, receiving the Holy Spirit, always refers to the Pentecost Sunday experience, okay? This is simply a matter of New Testament usage. Doesn't set aside the other, but it means from Acts 2 onwards, wherever it speaks about receiving the Holy Spirit, it's the Pentecost Sunday experience which is being referred to. Let's look quickly at three examples. Acts chapter 8. The events in Samaria after Philip went there and preached Christ to them. It says in verse 12 of Acts chapter 8, when they believed Philip, they were baptized, both men and women. Now Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
So we have to acknowledge that those Samaritans were saved. They believed, they'd been baptized, but their experience was not complete. And they didn't get any more from Philip. We read now in verse 14, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They were saved, but the apostles prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Not the Resurrection Sunday experience, but the Pentecost Sunday experience. For as yet he, the Holy Spirit, had fallen upon none of them. Notice, everywhere it speaks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it always indicates the Holy Spirit comes down from above. He had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were saved, baptized believers, but the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay? Three times we're told there that these saved, baptized believers still needed to receive the Holy Spirit. Not the Resurrection Sunday experience, but the Pentecost Sunday experience. And then in Acts chapter 10, verse 47, the events in the house of Cornelius. You remember Peter went there? brought them the testimony of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit fell, interrupted Peter's sermon, and all these Gentiles began to speak with tongues. And then this is the comment made by Peter. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? He was referring to the fact that they'd heard them speak with tongues. So they had received the Holy Spirit the Pentecost Sunday way. And then in Acts 19 and verse 2, when Paul first came to Ephesus, he met some disciples. But he felt there was something lacking in their experience, so he asked them this question. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now, if everybody automatically received the Holy Spirit in every sense when they believed, that would be a meaningless question, wouldn't it? So he was not talking about being born again. He was talking about receiving the Pentecost Sunday experience. Now, well, I want to come down to being very practical. I want to tell you how to receive. Doubtless, many of you have received. I think it's improbable that in a gathering this size all of you have received. Not merely am I telling you this for the sake of those who have not received, although I have you first and foremost in mind, but I'm also telling you this as a pattern for instructing people on how to receive the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you that I know it works. I have proved it in experience. I'm not offering a theory. Ruth and I were with a team in Zambia about two years ago now and there was a gathering of about 7,000 Africans in a very remote part of Zambia and I taught them very carefully and systematically the work of the cross, deliverance from curse, deliverance from demons which is essential in Africa and then the fourth morning I brought them to the teaching on the Holy Spirit and I taught them almost exactly what I've been teaching you. And then I said, now I want to teach you how to receive. And when I brought them to the point of receiving, I said, from now on, I don't want you to talk another word in your own language, only a new language. There was a pause of about one minute, and then one man began to speak in a new tongue, and in the next 30 seconds, I think at least 4,000 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit simultaneously. And this, not on the same scale, I've seen duplicated in many places. I was in a Catholic church in Austria some time earlier. The Catholic priest invited me to tell the people about the baptism and speaking in tongues. Uh, when you've got the priest on your side in the Catholic church, you can't lose. I mean, you're just the same as if you were the prophet Elijah. So I told them, just what I'm telling you, there were about 900 people in that church. When I said, how many of you want to receive, at least 500 came forward, gave them this simple instruction, and away they went, speaking in tongues, and then singing in tongues. And I'll tell you, that beautiful 
uh, stone and marble building heard sounds that I think had never been heard in it before. What a wonderful sight, 500 people, all newly baptized in the Holy Spirit, worship the Lord, singing in tongues. You see, once you turn Catholics loose, there's no stopping them. You just don't know where they'll end up. <laughs> Protestants have got a lot of inhibitions. They question whether the preacher is right and is this doctrine sound. As long as it comes from the authority in the Catholic Church, that's it. There's a lot to be said for that, though it does breed problems also. Now, I want to say one more thing, very important. The distinctive seal of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is speaking with tongues. Some people call it the evidence. Actually, I prefer myself to call it the culmination of the baptism. It's not the immersion, it's not the infilling, but what is it? It's the outflow. Now you can stop short of the outflow. Lots of people have been filled with the Spirit, but they never had the outflow. But why stop short of the outflow? And it, uh, Paul speaks about receiving the seal of the Holy Spirit, both in Ephesians and in Corinthians. A seal is something that's placed on, a, on, a, on an object, whatever it may be, a package, whatever, that marks it out visibly. It's not invisible. It's something that distinguishes it from all others. That's what the seal of the Holy Spirit is. It distinguishes those people from all others. You're a marked person once you've received the Holy Spirit. Marked by men and be warned also marked by Satan. Now, the, the seal that I see in the New Testament, this is my personal view, is speaking with other tongues. And I make these four comments. Number one, it was the seal the apostles received. They tarried for about ten days, but once they spoke in tongues, they never tarried again. And incidentally, nobody ever did tarry for the baptism after that. The idea that you have to wait around for weeks, months, or even years is unscriptural. After Pentecost, there was no more tarrying. I met a man in a Pentecostal church once, 25, he said, I've been tarrying for the baptism 25 years. <laughs> I said, I know your problem. You want God to do it all. He said, that's right, I want it all to be God. I said, you'll never get it. God will do his part, and you have to do yours. And I can easily believe he went to the grave without speaking in tongues. Tarrying is not scriptural after Pentecost. All right. It was the seal the apostles received. It was the seal they recognized in others. The outstanding example is the household of Cornelius. Peter didn't even believe that Gentiles could become Christians. The moment he heard them speak in tongues, he said, baptize them. They've received the same as we have. He didn't wait around for fruit. He didn't check if they knew the doctrines. He said, they've received. They never asked for any other seal. And the New Testament offers no other alternative seal. I think we've got seal and alternative the wrong way around there, but you're all smart enough to be able to put the words in the right order, I'm sure. Now, coming back to how to receive. Let's look, first of all, in Luke chapter 11. Verses 11 to 13. These are words of encouragement. Jesus is speaking. If he, sa he says, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? In essence, he's saying a father whose child asks him for something good will never give him something bad. Then he applies that to our heavenly father. He says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who, what? Ask him. You see, I've heard Christians say it's not scriptural to ask for the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, if you're a child of God, born again, then you have the right to ask for the Holy Spirit. And he actually places the responsibility upon us to ask. Bear in mind, if you are a born-again child of God, and you come to God your Father through Jesus the Son, the only way, if you ask for something good and scriptural, you will never receive something bad. That's your guarantee. But the responsibility to ask is placed on you. And then the actual steps to receiving... We turn to John chapter 7, 
and we read three verses, 37, 38, and 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, which I believe was the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, but that's too polite. The Bible says, out of his belly. I remember as a boy growing up in the Anglican church, I was always a little shocked when they read that passage that you would speak about anything so vulgar as the belly in church. The truth of the matter is, that's where it comes from. <laughs> there is an area in us. It's interesting, the, the Greek word means a, a kind of concave place. It's the same word root word that's used for the vault of heaven. So there is an area in the body of the believer which is reserved for the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? <laughs> See, don't be too spiritual. This brings the Holy Spirit right down into your body. Out of his belly. When I received the baptism there in an army barrack room without anybody else present, I felt it in my belly. I thought, what's going to happen next? Then I said out loud to God, if you want me to speak with other tongues, I'm ready to do it. I wasn't ambitious. The moment I said that, this fire moved up from my belly to my chest to my throat. The next thing I knew, there was something like a piece of hard rubber bouncing about in the back of my mouth, and I realized it was my own tongue. <laughs> I opened my mouth, and these strange sounds started to come up. But it's always been so vivid to me, it started in my belly. And that's what Jesus said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Isn't that a marvelous transformation? We have a thirsty man who doesn't have enough for himself. He receives the Holy Spirit and he becomes a channel of rivers. Not a river, rivers of living water. What a transformation. Now, the comment is put in by the writer of the Gospel, but this Jesus spoke concerning the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him, Jesus, would receive. All right. Believers are to receive the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The Holy Spirit in this sense could not be given till Jesus had been glorified. When was Jesus glorified? When he ascended into heaven and took his place at the right hand of the Father. Now if you go back to, to Acts chapter 2 just very briefly for a moment, you'll see that Peter summing up what happened on the day of Pentecost says in verses 32 and 30. 3 of Acts chapter 2, this Jesus God has raised up, resurrected, of which we all are witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, that's being glorified, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. So the glorified Christ received from the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit, and poured it out on the disciples, and the result, notice, was something that could be seen and heard. It wasn't just an invisible inner experience. It was an experience that impacted their bodies and impacted their senses. So, now we come back to John 7. How to receive. And I've got here four very simple steps. The problem is not that it's complicated. The problem is that it's simple. And the people who are theologically minded and want complication sometimes find it too simple to believe and to act on. What are the steps? Number one, be thirsty. If anybody is thirsty, okay, that's your qualification. You don't have to be able to quote scripture. You don't have to even have a record of pay, paying your tithes. But you have to be thirsty. That's essential. I tell people when they come to me, remember this, the baptism is for those who are thirsty and deliverance is for those who are desperate. <laughs> and when people come to me for deliverance, I, I sometimes say to them, listen, I can't help you, you're not desperate, come back when you are. However, we're not talking about that, no, we're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. It's for one group of people, the thirsty, it's not for theologians, unless they're thirsty. It's not for the super spiritual. It's for the thirsty. So if you feel very inadequate, and very weak, and really incapable of producing what God requires of you, you're qualified. That's your qualification. You know you need more of God than you already have. That is to be thirsty. That's all God asks. 
Number two, Jesus said to him, come unto me. Brother David Duplessis has said so clearly, there's only one baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and his name is Jesus. One didn't hear that. Jesus, that's right. So if you want the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you have to go to the baptizer. See, there's no other place you can get it. No human being baptizes in the Holy Spirit. They baptize in water, but only Jesus baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Fortunately for us, Jesus said, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you come, you know he will receive you. What's the next thing you have to do? Here's the problem. Here's where it becomes so practical and so simple that religious people have problems. You have to drink. <laughs> Nobody can force you to drink against your will. You know the old saying, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. That's true of church members too. Nobody else can make you drink. It's a decision of your will, and it's something very simple that you have to do. I tell people this, no one ever received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with his mouth closed. It never will happen. You have to open up your physical being and begin to drink in the Spirit of God. Now, you're not drinking visible water, but you're drinking the invisible Spirit of God which Jesus is pouring out over you. Why is he pouring it out over you? Because you asked him to, see? It's that simple. He said, if you come, I'll do it. Now, the simplest way to drink is just to begin to breathe in. I've seen hundreds of people doing it at one time, but I'll tell you what, not one person who did it failed to receive. People who stood there with a mm, 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 didn't get anything. <laughs> but here, I'm, talk I'm telling this because this is the problem. See, people are self-conscious. Well, they never taught me to do this in church. Maybe you're not. <laughs> All right, now, one more stage. You've drunk. Now you have to release the outflow. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. So the final phase is the outflow. How does that happen? Through the mouth, in speech. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because it's a supernatural infilling, it will be a supernatural outflow. You'll not speak a language you know. You'll speak a language the Holy Spirit gives you, one you've never heard, one you don't understand, one you never learned, and you probably never will understand. How do you know it's right? How do you know it's right? The answer is because you asked for the right thing, see? And God's given you a written guarantee, Luke 11, verses 11 through 13. If you ask for the right thing, you will never get the wrong thing. I'd like you all to say that. If I ask for the right thing, I will never get the wrong thing. Now turn to your neighbor and say to him, If you ask for the right thing, you will never get the wrong thing. Okay, now we're convinced. All right. Now let me just come to Satan's two objections. If I were to ask for hands up here, amongst those who've been baptized in the Spirit, you'd find 90% of the people would put their hands up. Objection number one, the old accuser is right there at, by your side, and when you begin to speak in tongues, he says, that's not real, you're doing it yourself. How many of you, just put your hand up for a moment, you see, it's almost everybody here. <laughs> All right, what's the answer? Uh, you need to have the answer. The answer is, you're quite right, Satan, I am doing it myself. I am doing the speaking, but the Holy Spirit is giving me the language. You see, in Acts chapter 2, it says, they all began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit didn't do the speaking. He gave them the words. They did the speaking. That's why I said to that man who tarried 25 years, he'd go to his grave without receiving because he wanted God to do it all. God won't do it all. You do your part, God will do his. But he's not going to make you speak. I've heard people say the Holy Spirit made me do this and that. I don't believe that. The Holy Spirit never makes a child of God do anything. The Apostle Peter said the Holy Spirit bade me go, but he didn't say he made me go. You have a free will and God will never overrule your free will because he created you that way. You've got to decide to speak. 
and you can't speak with your mum mum. I've, I've helped so many people. I say, listen, open your mouth, move your tongue, move your lips. Speak articulately. Form every word. You're in the driver's seat. You make the decisions. Your will is the switch. The power is there, but only you can switch it on. All right. So the answer to Satan is, that's right, Satan. I am doing it myself. I'm doing the speaking. The Holy Spirit is giving me the words. The next objection is, well, how do you know you got the right thing? See? Sounds very silly. Well, almost any language you don't know sounds silly. I've heard scores of languages I don't know in different parts of the world. They all sound strange to me. An unknown language is strange. But how do you know you got the right thing when we've just told one another? How do we know we got the right thing? Because we asked for the right thing and God guaranteed we'd never get the wrong thing if we asked for the right thing. Be brothers and sisters, the basis of this thing is faith. There is no other way to come to God. He that cometh to God must do what? Believe that God is. That's not enough. That is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, the only thing it remains to do now is receive. There are some of you who have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit in the sense you don't have this seal. You may have received, but you haven't had the outflow. And there are some of you who had had an outflow, but you wondered whether it was the right thing and you never had the faith or the courage to go on doing it. You've never had a real release. If you would like that full release this morning, here before this meeting closes, I want to help you. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Don't be embarrassed. And when you're standing, I'm going to lead you in a prayer by which you can come to Jesus and receive. Now, we don't have long... So if you want to receive, just stand to your feet now. Wherever you are, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's common sense to go to God for the best. Now there are some of you who are not quite sure whether you've received. You said a few words, your lips moved, but you don't really know. I'd like you to stand too. Because you can have a clear river. I tell people, remember this thing isn't a puddle. It's a river. It goes on and on and on. You don't just say, well, in 1974 I spoke in tongues once. That's not the story. That's not a river. That's a puddle. Okay. Any others that want to stand, you do so. Uh, about how long do we have? Can somebody tell me? Five minutes. Okay, that's ample. We can get it all in five minutes. But that's really a super allowance. Okay? It doesn't take long. Okay, now, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud, and I want you to pray it after me, sentence by sentence. But bear in mind, you are not praying to me. <laughs> You're praying to the baptizer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will cause you to say those things which qualify you as a thirsty person coming to him. And when you've said the final word, we'll say amen, so you know to stop praying. Now, after that, don't do any praying. Okay, what do you do? You begin to drink, all right? You don't need to gasp, just quietly take in the Spirit of God. Shut yourself in with the Lord, forget there are any other people here. And then there's that moment of faith when you begin to release the new language. Some of you are right ready to do it right now. You've got to break the sound barrier. You don't need to shout, you don't need to scream, but you need to say it loud enough to hear yourself so that when you walk out of this place, you know you've heard yourself speak with other tongues, with another tongue, okay? All right, remember, when we come to our men, no more English, no more Filipino, no more whatever it might be, Spanish, no more Chinese, no more Japanese, n some unknown language, okay? These are the words. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God and that on the cross you died for my sins and rose again from the dead. I trust you for forgiveness and for cleansing. I believe you have received me as a child of God. And because you have received me, 
I receive myself as a child of God. If there's any resentment in my heart now, any unforgiveness against anyone, I lay it down. I forgive every other person as I would have God forgive me. If I've ever been involved in the occult, I acknowledge that as a sin. I ask your forgiveness and I loose myself now from every contact with Satan and with occult power in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord Jesus, I come to you as my baptizer in the Holy Spirit. I present to you my body to be a temple of your spirit. I yield to you my tongue to be an instrument of righteousness, to worship you in a new language. By faith, I receive this now. And I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now just begin to drink. Just breathe in. Take it in. And then begin to speak out. When you speak, just open your mouth, move your tongue and your lips, and give him your voice. Many of you are ready to do it now. Shandara la bari ala masakari andara la bari andara. Induru lu bari ala bashari andara la bari andara. That's right. That's right. When your lips and your tongue are moving, give him your voice. That's right. You don't have to be ashamed that the Holy Spirit has come in. He's an honored guest. Sunduru lu bari ala bashari andara la bari andara. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Harama shandara la bari andara. Let's all stand to our feet and worship God together in tongues. Halabaranda lalabari andara shandari alabari andara. Urra alabashari alabaranda lalabari andara alabari andara. Indurulu bari alabashari andara alabari. If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org or write to us at DPMUK, Kingsfield, Hadrian Way, Baldock, SG7 6AN. In this three-part series, Exercising Spiritual Gifts, Derek Prince shares how the Holy Spirit, inbreathed by the resurrected Christ, outpoured by the ascended Christ, manifests himself through nine supernatural gifts. Now, Exercising Spiritual Gifts, Part 2, Interpreting and Prophesying. In our last session, we spoke about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, with the supernatural seal of speaking with other tongues. I believe that in the purposes of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is intended to be merely a doorway. There has been discussion in the Pentecostal movement in past years as to whether it was a goal or a gateway. And there was a time when some Pentecostals took the attitude, well, I'm saved, I'm baptized in water, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, I speak in tongues, I've arrived. Unfortunately, that's incorrect, and people who think they've arrived have just dropped out, that's all. The baptism is not a goal, it is a gateway. It's not the termination, it's the starting point of a life lived in supernatural power. I believe that normally, in most people's experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the doorway to the supernatural gifts of the Spirit and to many other forms of supernatural experience. I believe it is impossible to live the Christian life to the full on the plane of the natural. It is permeated with the supernatural. Every chapter in the book of Acts, and there are 28, contains descriptions of events that are totally supernatural. And the book of Acts is the only official record we have 
of what the Lord intended the church to be. So, going on from the baptism, I want to deal in this session and in the next with the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I'll begin, I think, by just reading the list, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8, 9, and 10. And if you check, you'll find there are nine gifts. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. It's been common amongst Bible teachers to divide up those nine gifts into three groups of three. This is not doctrine, it's just convenience. And I'll do it briefly before we focus on the particular gifts that I want to deal with in this session. There are three gifts of revelation. A word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, and what's the third one? Yes, somebody said it, discernings of spirits. Those are three revelatory gifts. There are three gifts which we can, for want of a better term, describe as gifts of power. Faith, miracles, what's the third one? Healings, that's right. And that leaves us with three which are usually called the vocal gifts because they operate through human vocal organ. Interestingly enough, the gifts that always cause the problems are the vocal gifts, because the tongue is the problem member in the body. What are the vocal gifts? Tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Now, we are going to deal in this session only with those three vocal gifts. We've spoken already about the seal of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking with another tongue or a new tongue. Now that really is not the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is called here and elsewhere kinds of tongues or varieties of tongues. In other words, it's more than simply speaking with another tongue. I believe every believer baptized in the Holy Spirit has the divine right and gift to communicate personally with the Lord in another tongue at any time. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 about that, He that speaketh in another tongue speaketh not to men but to God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. He that speaketh in another tongue edifieth himself. So there are three functions, three reasons for speaking in another tongue. Number one, you're speaking to God. That's a privilege. How many of you would agree that's a privilege? Direct communication, spirit to spirit with the living God. Number two, you're speaking mysteries secrets, things that potty little mind of yours doesn't understand. And three, you're edifying or building yourself up. A lot of people will ask you, what's the use of speaking in tongues? Well, there are three precise answers. The use of speaking in tongues is to communicate direct with God, to speak mysteries, and to build yourself up. If there were no other reasons, those would be sufficient. But I believe that the full gift of kinds of tongues goes on beyond that. Kinds of tongues is different uses of tongues. Another kind of tongue is to speak out loud in the assembly in an unknown tongue with something that is to be followed by an interpretation. Another use of the 
Tongues is as a sign to unbelievers. This is very rare. Most charismatics don't think about it. But it happens at times that when God's people are together or God's people are ministering, a believer will speak a language which he doesn't know, but an unbeliever present understands that language. That's a sign to unbelievers. I remember one case of a young man who is now my son-in-law many years ago was brought in from a street meeting in London. He was from Wales. And uh, you probably know the Welsh people have their own language, which they're very proud of. And uh, it was, quote, a gospel service, and I just preached my gospel message, and I was about to make my gospel appeal, and an elderly gentleman there spoke in an unknown tongue. Well, I was indignant. I thought, that's altogether out of order. He's ruined my appeal. <laughs> and I don't remember uh, what followed that, but... One of my daughters had brought this young man into the meeting and he nudged her and said, why is that old man telling everybody about my sins in public? <laughs> and uh, it took him, it took 10 minutes to convince him that the man didn't know a word of Welsh, but he was speaking Welsh, you see. In Seattle, Washington, some good many years ago now from St. Luke's Church, Episcopal Church there, there was a lady visiting the sick in a hospital and she came to a man and she spoke to him in English and he didn't respond, he didn't understand, he was there in bed sick. So being one of those crazy charismatics, she just spoke to him in tongues and he brightened up, answered her, she answered him back and they had a little conversation, the man was greatly encouraged. She didn't know what language she'd been speaking. She learned later it was Canary Island Spanish. That was his language. A friend of ours was in Russia not so long ago, a lady, and she uh, was sitting next to a Russian in the subway and the man looked so sad and so downcast, she thought, I'd love to do something for him. So she just trusted the Lord, opened her mouth and started to speak to him in Russian. <laughs> Now, those are exceptions. They're not normal, but they're one of the uses. And then I think there are many different forms of speaking in tongues, like how many of you have ever had the experience of seeming really angry when you're speaking in tongues? You know? I mean, you can't believe it. It comes out like a torrent. Well, I, I believe that when you're confronting evil forces. You don't know how to pray. You don't know what to say, but the Holy Spirit comes through them. And then there's tongues which is just for worship. It's just simply communication with God. In other words, tongues is a very rich field. Now, we are not going to deal with that any further now, but we're going to go on to the other two vocal gifts, interpreting and prophesying. We need to begin with a definition. The gift of interpretation has no meaning apart from the gift of tongues. But if someone has spoken in an unknown tongue by the Holy Spirit, the gift of interpretation enables either that person or another person, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not through intellectual understanding, to speak out in a known language that which was said beforehand in an unknown language. Now, it is interpretation. It's not exactly translation. That's interesting because uh, I don't know how many of you have spoken through, a, through an interpreter in a foreign country. I've done it many times. We, we discover all interpreters are different. Everyone uses certain words. Some use a lot of words. Some use fewer words. I remember we had a Canadian come out to Kenya when I was there. He was speaking through one of the best interpreters in the country. And he said a short sentence. And the interpreter took off and spoke for about two minutes. So the Canadian turned to his interpreter and said, uh, did I say all that? <laughs> so the interpreter said, no, but in order to make them understand what you said, I had to say all that. That's interpreting. It's communicating the sense. A brother that I know quite well from Britain, who is now in the States, told me that 
in the early days when they had rallies, Pentecostal rallies in the center of London, there was a, a situation in which somebody gave an utterance in tongues and they waited for the interpretation. And when it came, it came from a man who was a cockney. How many of you know what a cockney is? <laughs> Theoretically, born in sound of, within the sound of the Bow Bells in London. I cannot imitate cockney. Uh, it's outside my abilities. <laughs> but uh, the interpretation was this, and of course, I don't think you Americans will understand it, but Arthur Mo, my people, Arthur Mo. <laughs> well, half a mo is half a moment. In other words, hold on a moment, don't be so rapid. You see, that was the interpretation. <laughs> it's characteristic, it's a cockney interpretation. <laughs> so there's quite a lot of room for flexibility in this area of interpretation. However, it is communicating in a known language the sense of what was said previously in an unknown language. And then prophesying just goes one step further. Prophesying is speaking in a language that is known, words that are given by the Holy Spirit. They do not proceed from human understanding. They are given supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. The difference between interpreting and prophesying is that interpreting is preceded by an utterance in an unknown tongue and related to that utterance. Prophesying simply starts out in a known language. Very frequently, I believe, in places where God's people are gathered in assembly, there'll come an utterance in a tongue which is followed not by interpretation, but by prophecy. But the utterance in the tongue kind of calls God's people to attention and prepares the way for the prophecy that follows. Now, I want to <clears throat> lead you people, if you wish to be led, into the exercise of interpretation and prophesying in the next 30 or 40 minutes. I know it can be done, because I've done it with large crowds of thousands of people. It doesn't matter whether the crowd is small or large. All that matters is that people believe the Word of God and are willing to act on it. If you come into this experience, and you walk in it, it'll bring you into a new dimension of personal communication with God. I spoke to you yesterday about finding your place, and I think I challenged some of you to seek God for your calling. This is one of the ways that God can be begin to direct you into your place. I have seen people's eyes fill with tears of gratitude when God, through interpretation that they received themselves, gave them words of direction for their life. It kind of made God that much more real to them. It made the whole spiritual life much more real. So I want to begin by just giving you some scriptural encouragements to exercise the gifts generally. That's step number one. And the first scripture is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 and verse 11. Introducing this list of the nine spiritual gifts, Paul says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Notice the gifts are manifestations of the Spirit. The Spirit dwelling within you is not visible, cannot be perceived by human senses, but the gifts that proceed out impact human senses. It brings the Holy Spirit in you into relationship to the to human senses and though it's given to an individual notice it's given for the profit of all in other words if God gives you let's say a prophecy and you're too faint-hearted to give it out not only have you cheated yourself but you've cheated the others and the members of the body of Christ you see it's a it's a stewardship it's not something that you just use if you feel like it for yourself you're responsible God may want to speak to your neighbor through you. He may want to speak to the whole assembly. He may want to speak to the preacher. So don't have the attitude, well, if I don't feel like it, I don't think I'll do it, because that's not responsible. It's given to each one for the profit of all, for the benefit of all. And it's each one. 
And again at the end, in verse 11 of the same chapter, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. All right? Notice it begins and ends with each one. Paul's attitude is each believer is entitled to his manifestation of the Spirit. But the Spirit decides what manifestation each one of us will have. And then at the end of that chapter, <coughs> verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way, which is, of course, the way of love in the next chapter. Well, a lot of people use that scripture as a, as a stick to beat Pentecostals with. Well, love is the more excellent way. But that ignores the fact that Paul tells us to covet earnestly the best gifts. Love is not a gift. Love is a way. Love is fruit. So if we don't covet earnestly the best gifts, what are we doing? We're disobeying Scripture. See? Scripture tells us to do it. Let me say what I said yesterday. The gifts are not toys. They're tools. You need them to do the job. And if you refuse God's equipment and can't do the job, you're going to be answerable to God for the job you didn't do. And then in chapter 14, verse 1, pursue love. A lot of people stop there, but it doesn't stop there. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. It doesn't say pursue love or desire spiritual gifts. They're not options, alternatives. It's pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but particularly that you may prophesy. Are you particularly desiring this morning to prophesy? If not, you're not obeying Scripture. And then verse 26 says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. When God's people come together, we should not come, each of us, merely to receive. We should come, each of us, with something to contribute. And one of the main ways we can contribute is out of the gifts of the Spirit. See, that's God's equalizer. Some people are naturally gifted. They're intelligent, they're educated, they're articulate, they're not embarrassed, they can stand up and often speak too long. But there are a lot of others who are kind of mousy. And they don't have much, and they say, what can I do? Well, if it rested on your natural ability, that might be so. But the truth of the matter is, God gives you supernatural ability. And Paul says he gives it to the part that needs it most. You have two people in a church. One is a doctor, the other is what we call in Britain, a child lady. You wouldn't know what that is, but a cleaning woman. All right, now in the average non-spiritual church, the doctor becomes a deacon, the child lady just sits in a pew. Everybody knows that's her place. But when the Holy Spirit moves, the doctor is still a deacon, but the child lady becomes a prophetess. See? That's God's wisdom. That's God's justice. But if we refuse the supernatural, we just tie ourselves down to our own limitations. All right, now, bearing in mind that these two happen to be in the wrong order, as I said, that's just to keep you alert, we're going on to what is number three on the outline, is number two for me, specifically to interpret, okay? We're going to come now to the point where I'm going to lead you into the exercise of the gift of interpretation. Are you ready to be led? That's your decision. All right, I want to point out to you that the Bible encourages us to, inter to interpret. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. I wish you all spoke with tongues. <laughs> How many Baptist churches have known, acknowledged that? I wish you all spoke with tongues. How many is all? <laughs> all is all, isn't it? But that's not all. I mean, that's just the... First part, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless he, indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Understand that 
key word in this chapter is edify and edification. Everything is directed to building up the individual and the church. And Paul says it's fine to speak in tongues, but you're only edifying yourself. If you prophesy, you're edifying the church, the whole assembly. But he said, if you speak in a tongue and then interpret, that's as good as prophesying. And so he goes on in the same chapter, verses 12 and 13. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts. Are you zealous for spiritual gifts? All right, if you are, this applies. Let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Don't just restrict it to yourself. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, I am naive enough to believe that if the Bible tells us to pray for something, the Bible wants us to have it. I cannot conceive that the Bible would say pray for something, but it's not God's will. That seems to me incredible, totally illogical. So the Bible says, let the one that speaks in, tongue, in a tongue do what? Pray to interpret. So if you speak in a tongue, one thing you can do next is what? Pray to interpret. Now, let's go down to the bottom of the, the, the outline for a moment to encourage you. Two principles of petition. First of all, in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that's God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. The issue is, are we praying according to God's will? If we are, we know He hears us. And if we know He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we asked of Him. So the issue is, are we praying in God's will? If we are, then we know He hears us. If we know He hears us, we know we have the thing we ask for. Now, if God says, let him that speaketh in a tongue pray that he may interpret, to me, that indicates it's God's will for you to interpret. Otherwise, God wouldn't tell you to do it. Then about the time of receiving. This is very important. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11 and verse 24. Therefore I say to you, Jesus is speaking, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now that's not a fully accurate translation. The tense is wrong. What it says in Greek is, Believe that you received them, and you will have them. So whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you received them, and you will have them. So when do you receive? When you pray. That's right. Okay. And if you're praying in God's will, you know that He hears you, and you know that you have what you ask. Okay? So what we're going to do, very simply, well, let's look at the general assurance. We looked at it last time. We don't need to turn there. Jesus said, if you ask for bread, you'll never get a stone. If you ask for a fish, you'll never get a snake. If you ask for an egg, you'll never get a scorpion. If you ask for something good, you will never get something bad. Turn to your neighbor and say that. If you ask for something good, you will never get something bad. Okay. All right. Now, all we're going to do is act on it. Are you all ready? This is how we're going to do it. At a given signal from me, every one of you will turn to the Lord, shut yourself in, and speak in a tongue. All right? Your, remember, your will is the switch. You switch it on, you switch it on. I don't speak for about five minutes because your busy little mind will say, how can I ever interpret all that, see? Just start with a minute or two and don't dribble off. That's an awful mistake when speaking tongues. Speak and stop, okay? As a person who exercises the gift of interpretation, sometimes people speak in a tongue and you think, I'm going to start interpreting, and then they go on, another little dribble, and then another little dribble, and so on. Don't dribble. <laughs> speak, stop, and what do you do next? You say, now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, please give me the interpretation, okay? What's the next thing you do? You interpret, that's right. You believe you've received it. If you believe you received it, what do you do with it? You use it. See? Don't go on speaking in tongues. This is the reverse of the baptism. The 
problem with the baptism is people go on speaking their own language and so they can't speak in tongues because you can't speak two languages simultaneously. Now it's the other way around. You speak in a tongue, you've got that far. You speak whatever you feel God would have you to say, but God is very gracious. I mean, he won't take you beyond the measure of your faith. Then you stop. No more speaking in a tongue. You say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, please give me the interpretation. Then you take a deep breath and you interpret, okay? I, I mean, I, I can tell you from experience, I've seen this work for thousands of people. Because each one of us is an individual. The fact that there are a couple of hundred people maybe, that doesn't make any difference to God. You are dealing direct with God, okay? Now, when you speak, don't speak so loud that you disturb your neighbor but speak loud enough to hear yourself. You understand? Break the sound barrier, okay? And when we've done that for a little while, we'll stop and check and go back. Let me tell you something interesting. Normally, when you interpret, it'll take one or other of two forms. It'll either be praise and worship, or it will be God taking your lips and speaking to you, a message for you. Now, when I first started this, the percentage used to be about 60% praise and worship, about 40% God speaking to you. But things are changing, and now it's the other way round, which to me is indicative that God wants more and more to speak to his people. And it's usually 60% or more that get something personal from God, 40% that get praise or worship. Now, you don't determine what you're going to get. That's what the Holy Spirit decides. And be grateful for whatever you get, it's glorious. Okay, are we all ready? Now you speak in the tongue, stop, say, in the name of Jesus, please give me the interpretation. All right? Now, you should by now have finished speaking in tongues. Some of you have already received the interpretation. I'll give you another minute or two, but no more. Okay, we're going to stop and check now. How many of you received interpretation? Just raise your hand. Now you at the front, just turn, keep your hands up a moment because this is pretty good demonstration. I would say that's 90% or near. Now put your hands down and listen carefully. How many of you received praise or worship? Okay. How many of you found that God spoke to, took your lips to speak to you? Look at that. It's amazing. This is a real sign of what God is doing in the church. How many of you feel happy about it? <laughs> I mean, let me say, how many of you got a word of encouragement from the Lord? Direction. Beautiful. Okay. Now, those of you that didn't receive, don't feel left out. All you have to do is do what these people did, see? God has no favorites. We're going to do once more. And this is the last run around with interpretation. So we just speak in the tongue, stop, ask God for the interpretation, okay? I'm not going to give you a lot of time because the more time you get, the less likely you are to do it. Just plunge in with both feet.
Okay, we're going to check now. Now, I want to try and encourage people who maybe... How many of you this time received who didn't receive the time before? Would you raise your hand? Can't see. Uh, one hand there. Anybody else? Another hand. Praise God. Praise God. Good. The lady behind the camera received. That's really good. She deserves a little extra encouragement. Amen. All right. So now, step three is very simple. What's step three? Prophesy, isn't it? Let's look at a few scriptures again that encourage us to prophesy. We'll start in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. All right. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Why don't we all read it together? We've got probably about four different versions here, but let's everybody read that so we know it's there. Okay? Just wait till you find it. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Are you there? Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now, turn and read it to your neighbor. <laughs> The Bible says we should exhort one another, you see? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 and 25. Here's a description of a meeting of the church. You've all come together in one place. Paul says in verse 24, if all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbeliever, will they not say that you are out of your mind? If everybody comes to a meeting and all they do is speak in tongues, which happens in some churches, people who are not believers just walk and say, those people are mad. But, Paul says, if all prophesy, notice that, he assumes that all can prophesy. If all prophesy, that is, speak in a language that's understood, and an unbeliever, or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is judged by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and falling down on his face he will worship God, report that God is truly among you. Understand, the problem with a lot of Pentecostals is they never went far enough. They spoke in tongues and didn't go any further. And many, many people have walked into Pentecostal meetings and said, these people are crazy, I'm not coming near them. The problem was not with God's provision, it was with God's people who didn't avail themselves of the provision. What we need to do is go on from speaking in tongues to prophesying, to giving people words about themselves that they know we couldn't know naturally. You understand? The secrets of their heart are made manifest. Okay, one more scripture, two more scriptures. Verse 31. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. How many can prophesy? All. Are you sure? Yes, Say it again. All. That's right. Turn to your neighbor and read it to him or her. Now, this is what we're doing, you understand? Paul says you can have a learning session. It's not a full-scale meeting of the church, it's a learning session. This is the precisely where we're at. You can all prophesy that all of you may learn. And trustfully, you'll all be encouraged. And one more scripture, which is verse 39. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. And do not forbid to speak with tongues. Desire earnestly to prophesy. I pray God that, may, that he may put that in the heart of everybody here. An earnest desire to prophesy. You're not being presumptuous. You're not trespassing on God's grace. You're doing what God tells you to do. And you can all prophesy. One by one, individually. That's not to each other. We'll come to that maybe later. But what we're doing right now is we're practicing. How many of you would recognize it's nice to practice in a private situation before you launch out in front of the assembly? See? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, just because you're religiously disposed, 
I'll say a nice prayer for you before you do this. It, it will work without the prayer, but you feel better if I pray, see? <laughs> then, you know what you're going to do? You're not going to speak in tongues. You're going to? I didn't hear you. That's right. How many of you believe you can do it? Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. So, Father, we just thank you for your blessed presence with us here through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We acknowledge you as the personal resident representative of the Godhead now on earth. We give you the honor that is your due. You are Lord, and you are Lord here this morning. And Lord, you've brought us to this point where your people earnestly desire to prophesy. And so now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to release in them and through them the gift of prophesying for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. It's legitimate to speak out loud enough to hear yourself. There's something about breaking the sound barrier. Amen. Well, that was a serendipity, wasn't it? But don't let that keep you from your personal encounter with the Lord. That was a word of encouragement to all of us. Thank God for it. But I want each one of you to be released individually. God prompts me to tell you there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're under condemnation, don't accept it. Praise God. What language did you get that in? You did? What's your mother tongue? Well, why don't you get something in French? No, really, because it make, your mother tongue makes difference. I used to prophesy in French at one time. When I was with a French sailor in World War II, I got the most beautiful prophecy in French. So, you know, there's so much variety. Don't be tied down. How many of you got a prophecy? Just raise your hand. Right up, don't let me. Well, that's beautiful. I'm in. Now, those of you that didn't, we'll give you one more run at the jump, okay? Uh, don't feel discouraged. Just turn to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. If I'm bound, release me. Some are bound by fear, some are bound by embarrassment, but don't let that hold you back, okay? Father, thank you for what you've done for your people here this morning. We pray now that you will release those who are bound by fear or embarrassment or any other force, Lord, and you'll give them this beautiful gift of prophesying. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that's wonderful. Now, we'll release some of you who feel you've got a word that's for more than you. Speak it out to the people of God. Just stand up. If you're speaking there, turn around and speak to the people so that they can hear you. And whatever God has given you, you give it to them. This is to glorify the Lord, but it is for you and Ruth that you'll receive it. 
Well, uh, we'll be happy. Lord. <laughs> Sorry for laughing, but we've been trying to avoid India for so long. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Jewish believer very close to us in Jerusalem. He has prayed himself blue in the face for us to go to India. So I... <laughs> <laughs> That, that is really not a prophecy, that's a word of knowledge, but it's, it's very good, thank you. <laughs> that's all I need, thank you. <laughs> so, anybody else got a word you want to give out to the people? And remember, it's not for your prophet, it's for the prophet of all. Yes, stand up, speak it out clearly. Amen. Now, one danger is we hear prophecy and we say, that was wonderful, and we do nothing about it, see. And in the end, prophecy becomes ineffective. That's happened in hundreds of Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches. The Lord spoke specifically, and he said, I want you to come near to me and sit at my feet in private. You understand? So there's direction for many of you as to how God wants you to spend some of your, quote, spare time. You understand? Spend it in the presence of the Lord. How many of you will act on that if you feel that's for you? Good. All right. Praise God. Now let's see if we have some more. We've had some beautiful words. How many of you would agree? Also, you'll notice that when the prophetic gifts come, there tends to be a general theme that they follow, even from many different people. The theme here is God's love for us, his desire to draw us to him, and his desire to send us forth into all the world as his ambassadors, which is beautiful. My heart says amen to that. So let's just wait before the Lord. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be shy. If you feel God has given you something, if your heart is pounding, it's probably you. <laughs> just hold on. Just give me, your, give me a hand first. Stand up. And we'll take you next, okay? Stand up, this lady here. Amen. Thank you. I am the Lord God. I am your God. I will never leave you. I love you forever and ever again. Amen. See, the, the theme is God's love and encouragement. Yes? Stand up and turn around and speak to the people. This is my world. And my protection goes before you Amen. Right. Now, I want to say some of what we get is incomplete prophecy. It's perfectly valid, but, you know, the first time you swim, you don't swim ten lengths. So, remember, this is a thing we learn. It's progressive. The exercise of the gifts of the Spirit, very few people start exercising them perfectly, but the people who, who wait to be perfect before they exercise them never exercise them. So, thank you, brother. appreciate that. Now, is there anybody else? Yes, oh, wait a minute, we'll take my wife first, then the lady behind. Do you want to come and share my microphone? If you can get it on, you can get it off, presumably. Mm. I have looked upon your doubts and your fears, but I have also looked upon your love for me. And I want now to take away your doubt and your fear and to reassure you that I will be with you in every situation. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Indeed, I will send my angels before you. And they will prepare the way that when you come in, you need only come in and gather the fruit. There is a rich harvest waiting. And I am equipping you to be laborers, to be gatherers in of the harvest 
So lay aside your doubts and fears. Lay them at my feet, says the Lord. And I will give you my joy and my peace and my power. Just wait a minute. Now, let's act on what the Lord says. You understand? So important that we don't just hear prophecy and say, well, wasn't that interesting? I've, I've been in Pentecostal and charismatic churches where people would walk out of the church and say, wonderful meeting, we had four prophecies. I say, what did the prophecies say? I don't remember, you know. Well, what's the good of God speaking if we don't act on what he says? Now, the Lord spoke through Ruth and he said, there are many that have doubts and fears and you are to lay them aside. I want to pray for those that are troubled by doubt and fear right now. If you would raise your hand, I'm going to pray for you. See? Thank <laughs> goodness. <laughs> How's the church ever going to get into the world at this rate? <laughs> Amen. I think what you need to do, I'll lead you in a prayer, and I think you need to say it after me. Uh, say these words, Lord Jesus, I trust you. You loved me enough to die for me. You're my Savior, my Redeemer. I belong to you. For time, for time and for eternity. My life is in your hand. No one can pluck me out of your hand. Lord Jesus, I want to lay down fear, doubt, and unbelief. I ask you to deliver me from these things now. In your name, Lord Jesus. Give me your boldness. Give me your courage. Give me your strength. By your Holy Spirit, I pray. By faith, I lift up my hands. And I receive now from you. Amen, Lord. Jesus, pour out your spirit of love and boldness and faith upon these people now. In Jesus' name, pour out upon them. Pour out upon them in the name of Jesus. Amen, Lord. Amen. Now be a receiver. Don't just take your hands down too quickly. Be a receiver. Begin to thank him. Uh, arise and shake yourself. Shake yourself from the bands of your neck. Loose yourself from those chains of intellectual reasoning and the natural mind and your own little abilities. You have a great God, a wonderful God. That's right. Now let's give him a praise offering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, this sister in the second row behind my wife, you had something. Stand up. I will raise you in battle and lead you into the night of darkness. Thank you. Read the first part again. I will raise you in battle. Battle. battle that's right. Thank you. I think it takes real courage when your first language is in English. I appreciate that. Thank you. Again, I would like to say that's not a complete prophecy. It's just the beginning. But once you've started, don't turn back. You see? When I get a prophecy, I usually get just the first sentence. Now, if I sit there and think, I wonder what I'm going to say after that, I get no more. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. But if I give the first sentence, then the rest follows, you see? Anybody else? We've got a few, yes, up there, there's a young man with the left arm up. That's right, I saw you first time. Raise yourself up. You're a lady. <laughs> well, <no. laughs> How could I tell? <laughs> All right, can you be heard? Amen. Praise God. Now that was complete. Praise God for that. That's not the first time you've prophesied. Or is it? A long while. You have let your gift rust, you see. Now you need to, to tell the Lord you're not going to let that happen again. Okay. Time for about one more. 
Uh, yeah, we'll take this young man here. You are a young man, I'm sure of that. I feel like God's saying that we are the children of this pastor, and he wants to be our shepherd. He wants to control us, and he wants to love us, and for us to bask in his love. Amen. Thank you. Is that the first time you've ever done anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, well, congratulations. Now, don't stop. See how consistent the theme is, the love of God, his concern for us, that he wants us to be free from care and fear and to be bold. Amen. I think we should just stand to our feet now and give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you, Thank you Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your wonderful name, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Aranda la la bari la la sanda la la bari. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I think we meet again in about five minutes. Our next theme will be the gifts of revelation and power. Who knows what will happen then? If you would like information about further teaching resources available from Derek Prince Ministries UK, please call us and request a copy of our latest resource guide on 01462 492 100. You may also visit our website at www.dpmuk.org or write to us at DPMUK, Kingsfield, Hadrian Way, Baldock, SG7 6AM. In this three-part series, Exercising Spiritual Gifts, Derek Prince shares how the Holy Spirit, inbreathed by the resurrected Christ, outpoured by the ascended Christ, manifests himself through nine supernatural gifts. Now, Exercising Spiritual Gifts, Part 3, Gifts of Power and Revelation. In our previous session, we dealt with the three vocal gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. And I sought to lead you into the exercise of those gifts. And I think I was about 80% at least successful, for which I give God the praise. Now we have one remaining session in this series, and we're going to deal briefly with the remaining six gifts of the Spirit, under the two headings of power and revelation. Don't be fooled by the outline. That's not the whole outline. There's something more to follow, but we'll start with that. The lady that was making them, and she really is a lady, um, uh, her pen ran out, you understand? So that's why it stopped there, but the rest is just waiting to be put up. And we all really owe a real debt of gratitude to the lady. I think we ought to give her a clap. I don't know where she is. So. We need to pray for her. She won't fail her other exams because of all the time she's giving to this. All right, now the three gifts of power. The number one gift of power is faith. Now faith is used in many ways in the New Testament. The righteous shall live by faith. I have a book that's called Faith to Live By. That's the kind of faith every Christian has to be a Christian. Then in Galatians 5, faith is listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit. Now fruit and gifts are different. If you want to know the difference between them, consider a Christmas tree and an apple tree. An apple tree bears fruit. It takes a long process to bring the fruit out on the tree. It doesn't come instantly. It has to be cultivated. On the other hand, a Christmas tree, if you ever indulge in such things, either carries or overshadows gifts. Those gifts can be put there in an instant and taken in an instant. No time is involved. That's true with gifts. It doesn't take 30 seconds to receive a gift. That's the difference. Now, fruit is extremely important, but we're not dealing with that. We're dealing with gifts. The fruit of faith is usually translated faithfulness. 
uh, in actual fact, the Greek word for faith and the Hebrew word for faith both primarily refer to character, not intellect. That's interesting. Faith really is faithfulness. It's commitment to God. It's not entertaining a certain doctrine. That's secondary. However, we're not talking about the fruit of faithfulness. We're talking about a gift of faith, something that's received in a moment. What is the gift of faith? My answer is it's a mustard seed of God's own faith imparted sovereignly and supernaturally. We don't claim it, God gives it. There are two scriptures there you could look at, Mark 11, 21 through 23. You remember Jesus came up to a fig tree and he was displeased with it. He said, let no one eat fruit from you henceforth forever. Next morning the fig tree had withered from the roots. The disciples commented on that. Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Now that's the normal English, but what the Greek actually says is have the faith of God which is as different as day is from night. Jesus said, if you have God's faith, the words you speak and the things you do will be as effective as if God himself did it. It's not your faith, it's God's faith. In other words, he said, God's faith in me enabled me to determine the destiny of that tree. The words I spoke were as, effect as effective as if God the Father had spoken them. And remember, God brought the world into being by speaking. He spoke the world into being. Then he gives this promise in verse 23. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. <coughs> That's tremendously inclusive. Whoever says will have whatever he says. But you can't do that simply out of your own decision. That's only when God imparts to you his own faith in that situation as a gift. Now, put side by side with that, Matthew 17, verse 20, which describes the same incident. And Jesus says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it, will and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So Jesus said, if it's God's faith, you don't need a lot of it. A mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds, will move a mountain. In other words, it's not so much the quantity of your faith, it's the quality of your faith. The gift of faith is a little mustard seed of God's faith imparted to you in a certain situation for a specific task. While you are exercising it, you are as effective as God himself. Once it's over, you're back on the level of your own faith, the kind of faith you have to live by day by day. So that's the gift of faith. It is usually a catalyst. It tends to release the next two gifts. And at this point, we'll move on to the next sheet by the kind assistance of Brother Fenu, <laughs> who now becomes immortalized on this video forever. <laughs> All right, so we go on to the next of the gifts of power, which is the gift of healing. And notice in the original, it's all plural, gifts of healings. I personally am inclined to believe that every healing is a gift. And it generally works out that you find certain ministers have faith for certain types of healing. Like I have faith for back problems. I have faith for colitis. I have faith for asthma. I have faith for arthritis. But until recently, as far as people's eyes were concerned, 
I didn't have much faith. I say until recently because we recently in Pakistan and we saw maybe 10 blind people receive their sight. But that's a new development and I'm not quite sure what the next phase of that will be. But for years now I have prayed for people with back problems and most of them get healed. So there's two ways of understanding gifts of healings. Each healing is a distinct gift. And also, some people get gifts of healings for, let's say, arthritis or epilepsy. Others get gifts of healings for deafness or blindness or intestinal complaints. There's many different ways uh, this thing can operate. <coughs> and we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Now, in essence, the gift of healing, or a gift of healing, is God's supernatural power against sickness, okay? Healing relates to sickness. The only kind of people that can get healed are sick people. Okay, there's a statement in Luke 5, 17. Speaking about a period in the ministry of Jesus. Luke 5, 17, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Alternative translation, the power of the Lord was present with him to heal them. Notice, the power of the Lord was present to heal. So God's healing power drives out sickness and replaces it with health. It's a supernatural power granted by the Holy Spirit, released often through the laying on of hands, sometimes through anointing with oil, in various different ways, but healing relates to sickness. The next gift, miracles, can go further. Miracles go beyond healings. For instance, and this is from an example that has occurred more than once in my ministry. If a person has what they call otitis media, which is inflammation of the middle ear, you can pray for it and it can be healed. But if a person has had the middle ear removed by surgery, you can't heal a middle ear that isn't there, but a miracle can restore the middle ear. And I, have, I remember two occasions, two different occasions on which that happened. Once a man came up to me and said, pray for my ear. Thank God I didn't ask him what was the matter with his ear. So I prayed. He came back and said, I got healed. I said, what did you get healed of? Well, he said, I had no middle ear and now I've got one. But I went to the doctor and he checked that I have a normal ear. That's a miracle, you understand. That goes beyond the healing. The difference also is this, that miracles are often instantaneous, not necessarily, and often visible. Whereas healings are often invisible. If somebody is healed in the liver, there's nothing immediate that you can see. And many times they are also gradual. That's important to understand because if some people come to get healed, they don't get a miracle, they think nothing has happened. But it may be that they're receiving a healing. Now it's very important to understand this because if you are receiving a healing, a lot will depend on how you respond. I tell people, now you're plugged into God's supernatural power, keep the plug in. How do you do that? Basically by thanking God. Say, thank you Lord, you touched me. Your power is at work in my body. Every time you feel a twinge of pain or you see a symptom, you say, thank you Lord, your supernatural power is at work in my body. And as you respond that way, the healing is completed. But if you come up to be prayed for, God touches you, but you don't get a complete healing and you walk down and you say, well, nothing happened. What you've done is take the plug out, see? After that, nothing more happens. So it's very important to instruct people on these things. Uh, a miracle is frequently, I would say, usually released by a simple act of faith. You want to study a man who had a lot of miracles, the prophet Elisha. And almost every miracle that he performed was released by a rather ridiculous act of faith. For instance, there was a spring outside Jericho of which the water was corrupt. And he took a, 
a vessel of salt through the salt into the spring and said, Thus saith the Lord, these waters are healed. Well, everybody knows that salt doesn't heal water, you understand? But you can go to that spring today, more than 2,000 years later, and it's still healed. The salt didn't heal the spring, but the little act of faith released God's miracle power into the spring. Another time, the sons of the prophets were eating from a common pot of food and they discovered it was poisoned. And uh, Elisha just took some flour in his hand, threw it into the pot and said, Thus said the Lord, the pot is healed. It was healed. The flour didn't heal the pot, but the simple act released the miracle of healing into the pot. Another time, one of his students went out to build something by the Jordan, took his axe, borrowed an axe, to cut down some trees, and while he was chopping with the axe, the axe head flew off into the Jordan. Now, if you've never been in the Jordan, you might not realize how difficult that is, but the Jordan is a muddy river. There's at least two inches of just pure mud at the bottom. So the axe head didn't just lie on the surface at the bottom, it went down into the mud and disappeared. And Elisha said, all right, took a little piece of wood, threw it into the Jordan, and as it floated there, the axe head came up to meet the wood. Now, the wood didn't pull the axe head up, but the casting of the axe, the wood into the Jordan, released the miracle working power. You understand? See the principle? You usually have to do something silly to release a miracle. When, when a man born blind came to Jesus, Jesus spat on the ground, and everybody knows preachers don't spit in public. He made some clay with the spittle, anointed the man's eyes, and said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, that's ridiculous. But the man did what he was told and came back. Now see. we'll come to the gifts of revelation. Are they there too? They are. Now, first of all, most translations say the word of wisdom, but the Greek says a word of wisdom. And I understand it's very much like the gift of faith, but it's wisdom. God has got all wisdom. But if he were to dump all wisdom onto us, we crumple beneath the load. But in a situation where we need wisdom, it's not available to us by natural means. God gives us a supernatural word of wisdom, a little mustard seed of his own wisdom. Now the nature of wisdom is that it's directive. It shows you how to proceed. It shows you what to do. A word of knowledge is similar, but it's knowledge, not wisdom. It's a little mustard seed of God's knowledge uh, given to you in a specific situation to accomplish a specific purpose. Twenty or thirty years ago, the word of knowledge was almost non-existent amongst God's people. Today, it's becoming relatively common. Thank God for that. One of the ways that it operates is that the Lord will show somebody the sickness of a certain pre person present. And when that person is called out on the basis, that revelation of that person's problem creates faith in the person to receive healing. You understand? God is always working to create faith in us. The real purpose of the gifts, in a way, is to create faith. Uh, Ruth sometimes gets this gift of a word of knowledge while we're together. We were in Britain last April, and I was speaking in a Sunday morning service, which was not a healing service. And just before I got up to speak, Ruth tapped me and said, I think the Lord's given me a word of knowledge. So I said, fine, you give it. But before I did that, knowing my British people, I gave them a little lecture on responding. I said, don't sit there and say, well, I think that might be me, or I'd be embarrassed to go up in front of all these people because you'll miss God said, if it's you, you need to get up and come out, and we'll pray for you. So then Ruth got up and described a person who was thought she was go the person was going blind in the right eye. Well, in the second row, there was an Indian lady attired in her sari. Ruth hadn't gone halfway through the sentence before she was up on the platform. You see, that's the difference between Indians and English people. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, she said, the only reason I came to this meeting is because I think I'm going blind in my right eye. <laughs> so I said, are you a Christian? She said, I'm a pure Hindu. <laughs> See, God got his hook in her. 
That's the only way he could have got her confronted with the gospel. So I said, are you willing for me to pray in the name of Jesus? She said, yes. Are you willing to confess that Jesus is the Son of God? So she thought it over and said, yes. We, she did and we prayed for her. She was back that evening and she saw a whole lot more miracles. And she came up to us at the end and she said, in effect, I really don't know what's happened to my Hinduism now. <laughs> so Ruth said, well, you're answerable to God for what he's shown you. That's uh, just another example in Amsterdam this past summer with Youth with a Mission there. We had a healing service and God, God gave Ruth a word of knowledge, a rather strange one, about somebody who'd had a cut in his body that went like that or like that. And she was a little diffident about giving it because it seemed so strange. But when she gave it, a young man stood up, came out, said, that's me. He said, I had surgery on my back, but they had to cut from this side all around. So we sat him in the chair and said, are you a Christian? He said, yes. <laughs> so when did you get saved? Last night on the street. So that was beautiful, wasn't it? So God showed him how interested he was in him as a person. See, that he picked him out on that basis to call him forward and get healed. Now we may have a word of knowledge before we finish here this morning. But we'll go on to the next, which is discerning of spirits. But actually both parts are plural. It's discernings of spirits. Like gifts of healings, workings of miracles, kinds of tongues. There are several of the gifts which are plural in both parts in the original. Now to discern is to recognize and to distinguish between. So discerning of spirits is recognizing spirits and discerning or distinguishing between them. It's a kind of spiritual sense. You see, God can reveal that kind of thing two ways. He can give a word of knowledge. Such and such a person has a spirit of fear, or a spirit of epilepsy, or a spirit of death. That's one. Or he can show the servant of God, you can see it. Not with the natural. Like, there are certain spirits that Ruth and I encounter so frequently, we almost immediately identify them. One is the spirit of death. There's something about a person who has the spirit of death that shows in their features, in their eyes. Another is witchcraft. We were in Holland, oh, several years ago now, five years ago. And we had a healing service, and a lot of people were coming forward. And there was this young woman, I think she was from Indonesia, and she was highly pregnant. I mean, she must have been at least eight months pregnant. She came forward, and as we put our hands on her, she became like a, like a scalded cat. I mean, she reached for my eyes with her fingernails and uh, became violent. A couple of men had to hold her. And we identified the spirit of witchcraft. We commanded it to come out. She was released and became a lady again. <laughs> then she told us this, which was interesting. I don't fully understand it. But she said she'd made a covenant with Satan not to come to that meeting. <laughs> So, you know, she was in a strange background. Well, after that, the next 15 people we prayed for, every one of them, we just went for the spirit of witchcraft, and there it was. But I, I want to say that this discernment is not restricted to demons. It's important to discern the Holy Spirit, where he is, what he's doing. I believe you can discern a human spirit, like when Jesus said of Nathaniel, he was an Israelite in whom is no guile. That's a pretty rare thing, I want you to know. But Jesus discerned that guileless spirit in Nathaniel. Okay, now, that's a little summation of the gifts. Now, I think we need to move into action. This is at the point at which I'm totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't turn up or work, this will be a fiasco. But I have to say, he's remarkably faithful. Exercising the gift is like going out on a limb. You have to take a risk. The people who never take a risk never do anything in this area. 
So what I want to do with Ruth helping me is what we normally do in many places, and some of you have seen us do before. We're going to pray for the sick. But I'm going to exercise a particular gift which God gave me in 1970. So I am now, I'd have to say, confident about this gift. I've exercised it for 15 years, and I've seen, I can say fairly, thousands of people healed through it. Now, not all the people that we pray for are healed. There's a certain sovereignty of God which we can't overrule. This gift is a gift of faith, supernatural faith, for certain kinds of physical problems. First and foremost, for people who are lame, whose legs are unequal, and a, going with that for people who have back problems. And as a matter of fact, most people who have back problems have unequal legs. It's very rare to find a person with a back problem whose legs are fully equal. Now let me say that I have ministered to chiropractors in this field and they've admitted that it works. So I'm not just offering you some wild theory, although it's very strange. When I first started checking people's legs in public, some of my dear brothers suggested that I was, it was a dangerous thing to do. I had just established a reputation as a scholarly Bible teacher. For me to go around checking people's feet and measuring them would ruin my reputation. Well, I survived. I think because of the results, you see. I tell people in a healing service, our motivation is just as practical as that of a doctor or a dentist. Our aim is to heal the sick. Our methods are different, our motives are the same. And I always thank God for doctors, dentists, nurses and others. I tell you, there are so many sick people in this world that if we all became an army, we couldn't meet all the needs. Sometimes, especially in third world countries and other places, when I see all the sick, I can hardly bear the sight. It almost overwhelms me, the thought of human need and suffering. But we do what we can. That's all we can do. So I'm going to begin to exercise this gift. Um, and I'm going to begin by ministering to people with back problems. Now, I've never had a shortage of clients ever since I started that. I think more than 50% of Americans have back problems. The advantage about this as a, a breakthrough is that, first of all, I've got plenty of customers. Secondly, the results are visible. You understand? People see what happens. Uh, Twenty years ago, most Christians had never seen a visible miracle in their lives. There's, fortunately, there's a great change coming. But just one visible miracle can totally change the outlook of a person or the attitude of a congregation. I'll tell you one story. This is true. And it's so funny that I have to promise you it's true. Some years back, I was asked to speak in a Methodist church in a certain American city, evangelical but not charismatic. And they said there are two services from 9 to 10 and 11 to 12. We want you to speak at both. So. I spoke from 9 to 10, was very safe, stayed within the boundaries of being evangelical, and that was that. Well, then I found myself waiting around between 10 and 11. So some sympathetic soul came up to me and said, would you like to go to the adult Bible school, Bible class? So actually, I wasn't the least bit interested, but I thought it's better than hanging around. So I said, okay. Well, then without my knowing it, they brought two or three different classes together and they said, would you like to speak? <laughs> well, they hadn't warned me. So I thought, what do I tell these people? And I said to myself, I owe it to them at least once to tell them what's happening in the church. So I tried to describe the charismatic movement to them. Well, they didn't respond. It was outside their total range of reference. So I thought, I'm not getting anywhere. So I began to teach them about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, it was like describing the back side of the moon to people who've always lived on earth. I mean, it just didn't work. Really. So I stopped and I thought, this is just wasting time. And I said, is there anybody here with unequal legs? And somebody put his hand up the back. 
I said, would you like to be prayed for? He said, yes. So I said, put a chair out in front. I said, come and sit in the chair. Sat him down, measured his legs. Everybody who was near could see the difference. His short leg grew out, and I said, there you are. <laughs> well, the moment that happened, the attitude of the people totally changed, instantly. So everybody wanted to be prayed for. So I was scooting around on my hands and knees, measuring people's legs and praying for them. And a lady who had a blanket over her legs, somewhere on that side, said, pray for me. So I scooted over, held up her legs. One was shorter than the other. It grew out. I said, there you are, and went on to the next. Well, after a little while, I saw this lady getting very excited. She said to me, I don't think you know what you've done. Well, I said, if I don't know, tell me. Well, she said, when I came here, I had MS. That's multiple sclerosis. She said, I don't think I have it now. Well, I said, if you don't have it, let's see. So I got her out of the chair and got in the middle of the class doing knee bends in front of everybody. She was completely strong. Now, I had no idea she had MS. I think if I had, I'd have probably got in God's way, you understand? Because I had to try to introduce my own ideas. I just released what I had and she took it. Well, the end of the story is this. At the end of the class, she waited around very diffidently till everybody else had left. And then she said, you know, Mr. Prince, I'm a Roman Catholic. And this is the first time I've ever been to a Protestant church. I didn't know they were like this. <laughs> But I will tell you one thing. I'm a Protestant, if I'm anything, and I'm not interested in being a Protestant. Catholics are the easiest people to pray for. Because once the priest says it, that's it. You know, they've just got to obey. I was in a Pentecostal church, my own Pentecostal church in Copenhagen, years back, praying for the Danes. And the Danes, I don't know whether we've got any Danes here. My first wife was Danish. But they are pretty, I would say, stodgy. I mean, they don't easily get infused. And I was really working hard. I mean, I was sweating and there wasn't much happening. Then I prayed for three people in a row and they all got healed. So just jokingly, I said, they must be Catholics. The funny thing is, they all were. <laughs> well, you, if you know Pentecostals, I mean, <laughs> you can't believe that Catholics would get what Pentecostals don't get. All right. Now, the way we're going to do it is this. Uh, Fenu, I think you're going to help me. Um, that's right. Would you come and move these, on the, move these chairs forward a little? And Ruth, would you take my Bible, my outline, and we'll move... Would you move that right over there? Thank you. Right, so it doesn't cover the thing. Thank you. Now, wonderful. Move them, uh, separate them as much as you can. That's right. No, you can't go that far because of the plant. That's about right, okay? Ruth, would you come up and stand there? Thank you, that's beautiful. All right. Have you ever been in one of my meetings before? Once in Honolulu. Once in Honolulu. I, I knew from the way you arranged the chairs. I... <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, we're not going to be able to pray for everybody. You understand, this is just a a demonstration. It's just to break through. It's just to bring the gifts out of the realm of theory and theology into the realm of practical experience. That's our motive. Do you have anything? Yeah. I believe Ruth has got a word, so we'll take that first. I have the impression that there's someone here who has been having chest pains. You have not been to the doctor, but you're afraid that it is a heart condition. And if you will identify yourself, the Lord will touch you now. Come on up. Um, Fenu, we may need a catcher. All right. God bless you. You're Doc Witty. Are you really a doctor? PhD. PhD. <laughs> in what? It's just a name that's been given to me as an endearment name. Uh -huh. 
What PhD is in systematic theology. In systematic theology. Wonderful to have I'm you here. I'm one of those terrible theologians. Yeah, that's right. Well, forgive me if I've said anything I shouldn't say. I really do it because so many theologians stand in the way of God's people getting what they should have. It's wonderful to have you here. Now, we, you see, if God called you out, that means he's interested in you. He wants you to be healed. Okay? So all we're going to do is just lay our hands on you and pray for you and you just proceed no matter what happens if God smites you with his power that's fine if nothing visible happens you have still received okay father we thank you in the name of Jesus that you're going to touch our brother now Lord. thank you in Jesus name amen thank you Lord. amen amen just begin to breathe in just take in the healing presence of God that's right thank you Lord Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. That's right. Now start to thank Him. That's the purest expression of faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. That's right. Just take some deep breaths. That's the healing presence of God. That's right. Let all anxiety go, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I believe the Lord wants to tell you that he has a bright future for you. That he's going to open new doors for you that out of your experience here, you're going to become a guide and a teacher to many who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. So be bold, be courageous, do not hold back. Graciously and wisely speak all that God has shown you and God will honor it and confirm it with signs following. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the Lord a praise. Thank you, Lord. Have any others? What? Well, I think we'll start right now this way. Now, I'd like to call up people with back problems. We've only got four seats. Uh, before you come up, I just want you to stand up where you are. If you want to be prayed for with a back problem, I want to talk to you. I like to check the nature of the problem. Uh, this lady here in the mauve blouse, what's the nature of your problem? Uh huh. Treated by a doctor, by chiropractor. MD, what are their um, uh, diagnosis? Uh huh. So you know your real problem, don't you? It's stress. Like many people, come up and sit here, please. Uh, this lady here. You have a vertebrae one? Uh huh. Okay. Well, come up. See, I like to check that people have been medically diagnosed, you understand? So that you, people don't think I'm just inventing these problems. What's your problem? Uh, my spine is not straight and it the nerve. And I have to the Yeah, I know that problem. Now, I come up and sit here. I, incidentally, I appreciate chiropractors. I want to say that because I've seen so much back pain that appreciate people that do something about it. That gentleman with a the beard there and your arms folded, what's your problem? Okay, come on up. Um, you understand, part of your problem is you didn't keep the plug in. See? 
It's one thing to be touched, it's another thing to keep the plug in. Sit down in that chair. Now I'll let the rest of you sit down for the time being. I want you all to be in an attitude of prayer and worship. That doesn't mean you have to keep your eyes closed, but don't just be spectators. Be involved with these people for whom we're praying. All right? Okay, let's start with this lady. Can I check your legs, please? Okay, your right leg is a little bit short. Can you see that? Can you feel it growing now? That's right. There you are. That's right. Take everything God has for you. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Father. That's it. There you are. That's right. That's right. That's a demon of pain. Let it out. Out in Jesus' name. Out. 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 That's right. Get it out in Jesus' name. Out. Out. You have to come out in the name of Jesus. Just out. Cough it out. That's right. <laughs> you have to go. Out. In Jesus' name, out. All the way. All the way. Every root and every branch, come out. Come out of that neck. Come out of that shoulder. Out of you, sir. That's right. That's right. Get it all the way out. That's right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes. And Lord, we break the power of tension and stress over this one. That's right. In Jesus' name. That's right. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Breathe that out. Let it go. That's stress. Just breathe it out. That's right. You have to cooperate. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you. That's right. There's more to come. Just let it go. You might as well get everything. Don't get half, a, half, half the package. That's right. Hate your enemy. He's tormented you long enough. Say, Satan, release me. Satan, In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah. No, Satan, you have to go. You've been renounced. I renounce you in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Savior. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes. Would you renounce every contact with the alcohol? I renounce every contact with the alcohol. In Jesus', In Jesus name. name. That's right. Amen. Uh, That's right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you. I think it would be good if we would have one of the uh, counseling staff who is, is, are there any with any experience in deliverance here? All right, come on. Uh, just stay with her and just stand by her. Don't get too active, just encourage her faith. She needs to be encouraged, to be fully released. We can't, in this situation, we can't take all that time with just one person. Now tell me what your problem was again. That's right, okay. Now, listen, I've got an option for you. Do you want to be taller or shorter? <laughs> what? Taller. Taller, okay. That's easy. The other is more difficult. Let's have your legs. Turn your toes out. You're a very a pretty level person. That's right. Your right, your left leg is a little short. Can you feel it growing out now? Now that's the evidence God's power is in you. That's right. Now just receive it in every area where you need it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't tell you two things which were in my outline. First of all, 
very commonly when we minister healing it brings evil spirits out into the open that happened frequently in the ministry of Jesus it happens today we've just seen one such instance another thing I want to mention is that when I first met Ruth she had a ruptured disc and a curved spine and now she has no ruptured disc and she has a straight spine and uh, she has real faith that's to stand with people. Now what's your problem? Yeah. Okay. You're wearing a brace? No. No. Ooh. Well, no wonder you have problems. Can you see the difference in your legs? See, your left leg is an inch short. Can you feel it growing while I'm talking to you? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. Just take everything. Don't bother about us. Just relax and take everything. Amen, Lord. We release him from all pain in Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Just, just sob it out. Just release. That's right. That's right. You suffered a lot. You often wondered whether God really loved you. You got so discouraged. Today, he's demonstrating that he's faithful, that he loves you that he cares for you, that his love is individual. It's not just general, collective. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's right. Lift your hands up and praise him. That's right. Receive everything with thankfulness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's just quietly worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. Okay, now you're the one with the build up. It's a lower back, but I have a. Uh, yeah, but you have a build up in your shoe too. Right now I don't have a shoe you don't. in the build up, but I have a shoe. Good, you okay. Can you move in just a little bit? Can you move in just a little? That's right, thank you. Yeah. That's right. And I believe the Lord showed me what he had the spirit of infirmity. Uh huh. Did you hear that? Ruth says you have a spirit of infirmity. I'll tell you another spirit we commonly encounter is what's called the crippling spirit which twists people's bodies, makes their spines curve, makes their legs, their limbs unequal. So if we come against those things, don't think you're some special case. It's very common. All right, I'll plug you in and see what happens. That's all I can do. <laughs> do you know that your legs are now perfectly equal? Do you know that? <laughs> oh, I threw away my 3 h <laughs> God has healed him, you see, before I ever got to him. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now just take everything God has for you. Yes, Lord. Every kind of discouragement, Lord, we reject it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. I believe God is speaking to you now into your own spirit. That's right. I think if you lift your hands up and just worship Him. I'm a great believer in receiving through your hands. Amen. Lord, let the healing, miracle working power of God flow through these hands and these arms into His body, into His spine, to every area where He needs them. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, take it. Whatever comes, take it. That's right. That's it. Now sob it out. That's the spirit of infirmity. Sob it out. Don't hold it back. Let it go. That's right. Out in Jesus' name. That's right. You don't have to pray. Let it go. That's right. Sob it out. All the way out. In Jesus' name, you go. That's right. In the name of Jesus. That's right. Out. In Jesus' name, out. 
That's right. Hate it. Cough it out. Just drive it out of your throat. That's right. Let's go. Uh, that's right. That's right. You have to go, Satan. You've been exposed. Amen. In Jesus' name. Out. All the way. Every root and every branch. That's right. There you are. Amen. Now, God wants you to dedicate your life to the Lord here this morning. Don't walk away from this and turn your back on God. Just dedicate your life to Him. Sit there and talk to Him privately. Amen. Now, because of shortage of time and space, we're going to ask these people that are here to go down. But keep your plug in, every one of you. Keep thanking God. Say, God, I thank you that your supernatural power is at work in me. All right? God bless you. And this lady, I think you're probably going to need further counseling. But don't stop thanking God for what he's done. Okay? All right. We've got five minutes left. What are we going to do? We'll pray for four more people and then we'll kind of turn it loose. Um, people with back problems not being prayed for, want to be prayed for, would you stand up quickly? Mm. That lady there in the flowered blouse, yes, you. What's your problem? Talk loud. All right, come on. Uh, there's a fair-haired young man. He really is a man. He must be a man out there. That's right. <laughs> What is your problem? Uh, come on. What's your problem? We're looking for you. That's right. <laughs> One more. Uh, that gentleman in a red shirt with white stripes. Come on. All right. Now we keep worshiping God. We don't have to close our eyes. We have to be involved, but let's keep worshiping. Amen. All right. Then we'll try and do something more. Even if time has run out, we'll do something quick and see what happens. All right. Tell us the problem again in one sentence. Arthritis. That's right. Now, I deal with arthritis normally as an evil spirit. That won't offend you. That doesn't mean you're an evil person. It means the devil is tormenting you, okay? So if I tell it to go, you know what your job is? Let it go. Let it go. Exactly. You said it. Can you scoot back on the chair? All right. Now we're going to plug you in and see what happens. Well, one reason you have problems is your left leg is half an inch short. Can you see that? See that? Yeah. Don't push it down because we've got it in the natural position. Can you feel it growing now? Can you feel that? That's right. That's the healing warmth of God. Oh, Jesus. Amen. Now, Lord, we release her from the torment of arthritis. In Jesus' name, up. Sunda. Let it go. Out you go. That's right. Sob it out. That's right. Out you go. In the name of Jesus. That's right. All the way. That's right. You've got to hate it. We can't do that for you. That's out, right. You have to go. Out in Jesus' name. You tormentor. Come out in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you can begin to thank him. That's right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's right. That's right. More go. Out you go. Sum it out. You have to work with us because if you don't cooperate, we can't do it. That's right. That's right. Never mind your dignity. That's not important. <coughs> Ask God to forgive you. Renounce it. Say, Lord, forgive me every contact with horoscopes. Forgive me for everything. Yes, I renounce it all. In Jesus' name. That's right. Amen.
That's right. You see, you exposed yourself to Satan's claims. That's right. Thank you. Everybody who goes into the occult gives Satan a legal claim against them. No, never mind, but that's fine. I mean, we're not blaming you. I'm just explaining to the people. Just, just continue to thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, that's thank right. And let all that misery come out. That's right. That's right. That's right. Get rid of it. That's right. That's right. Let it go. Amen. Out. Amen. Out you go, you two. Yes. Let it go. Mm -hmm. That's right. Let it go. Yeah. Have you been under medication? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's partly the result of the medication. See? Amen. Lord, we break every satanic hold over this life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Brother, I think we better ask you to stay with her and there's more to come out, see, but because of the time limits we have to just, uh, don't be merciful to demons. No, this is very important. We sometimes seem to be angry. We're not angry with the person, we're angry with the demon, you understand? There's no sin to hate the devil. In fact, it's a sin not to hate the devil. <laughs>